All right. Good morning. We are, uh, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> we are uh, about to get started with our worship service this morning. And we are live. And so we're going to do a few announcements. Um, I First of all, I'd like to start by thanking you for choosing to come to God's house this morning. I want to welcome you to Love Memorial Baptist Church. And thank you for being here. And uh, we pray that you enjoy worshiping with us as much as we're going to enjoy worshiping with you. And so thank you for coming in. I'd like to ask you right off the bat, if you would, there's a first-time guest or first-time uh, visitor with us this morning. If you slip your hand up, we would love to give you a little uh, packet of information and ask you then to fill out a form of your own. Nobody, I don't see one. And if I missed it, I'm sorry. But anyway, uh, and I do one other thing I needed to do this morning uh, too as a part of this is that we have been, you know, we've been doing... Um, sending out prayer cards and praying over the prayer requests that you submit for years. And um, we have gotten a little bit out of the habit of, as you, you all have, of filling out these prayer cards so that we would know of those prayer requests. And I don't have one with me. I'm not prepared. But those little yellow cards that are in front of you, every Sunday I used to, uh, I used to mention those. And I'll probably not do that every Sunday. But if you have a prayer need or a prayer request, if you would write it down, on that and submit it, get put it in the offering plate when you would leave or hand it to one of somebody, one of us. Um, that prayer request will be prayed over um, by the Tuesday group, prays over it, we pray over it in the prayer room, we'll pray over it as we send a card for those people and we, we believe in prayer and so, but we need to know who you want us to pray for. And so we submit those on Sunday night, you know, we talk about those and Wednesday night we talk about them too. Anyway, we just want you to know, we want to know what you need us to pray for. So please submit those little cards. And uh, also, um, so in our um, bulletin there, and I say this every week, this is a handy little item with all the stuff you need to know in it. And so I'm just highlighting those things. You need to read them. Uh, anyway, so we need some additional nursery workers, um, primarily Sunday night and Wednesday night. But anyway, if you're uh, feeling called to that, please talk to Brian or myself or some of us about being um, uh, taken on one of these positions, the annual yard sale for TSMs on May the 14th. You got some items you want to donate for that, then um, we'd love to talk to you about that. Feed the Hunger Packathon March 19th. We're going to need 60 or 70 people. We're going to pack 15,000 meals in two hours, and it's going to be awesome. You'll have a wonderful time because we're doing ministry. Uh, we're meeting in the name of the Lord. We're getting together with our brothers and sisters and just having a good time. And uh, the Wednesday night meals are starting back Wednesday night, this coming Wednesday night, March 2nd, 6 o'clock. Cost is going to stay the same, $5 a person, maximum of $15 a family. But we need you to let us know um, if you're coming. The standing reservation list is no more. So if, you want to come, if you're going to come, you need to let the office know. So uh, all that information is in here, so please let us know about that. The only other thing I need to tell you is that Miss Lena Lee, well, um, Candy Martin, at the, there at the hospital this week, she's been having her radiation. She, in preparation for getting her T cells in the morning, and if everything goes correctly, then she'll be um, ten days. She'll have to be um, uh, quarantined, and then for three weeks after that, she'll have to be limited as to who can go. And Miss Lena needs some help going back and forth. So if you can drive her call the office here or call her uh, if you want, whichever way you want to do it and we'll work that out, but she needs some help doing that. So, uh, and I think we got a video we're going to watch about uh, Feed the Hunger and then we'll get started with our worship. Thank you.
Well, good morning, church. It's an honor and pleasure to be here with you this morning. Could you please stand as we worship our King? breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes a orphan a son and daughter, the King of glory? The King of glory, with truth and justice, shines like a sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. And you would take my place And you would bear my cross You laid down your life And I would be set free Whoa, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. I you would take my place. And you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all 
pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here to lift our voices and praise you, Lord. Thank you. I can feel your spirit already in this place, Lord. I just pray as we continue to worship, Lord, that our hearts will be open, that we would just receive your Holy Spirit, Lord, and that we would draw close to you, Lord, if there's anything on our on our hearts that we need to share with you, Lord. The altar is open, the whole service, Lord. I just pray that... Um, that we would keep our focus on you during the service, Lord. And I just thank you again for how good you've been to each and every one of us, no matter the season or, or the circumstance, Lord. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing calls for songs of loudest upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to i 
interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I am constrained to be. Let thy grace fall like a feather. Find my wandering heart to be. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts of You may be seated. I'm going to make a statement, and if it's true for you, I want you to say, thank you, Jesus. I've been saved. I've been changed. I've been delivered. I'm free from the chains that held me. Through his blood and by his grace, I have been forgiven. I am saved, and I will never be the same. Amen.
Well, anybody expecting that this morning? Um, you know, I, I, my mind works in strange ways. Sarah has passed out several times, and, and the worst thing about that whole deal for her is going to be that all of you had to watch it take place. I was hoping they could move her out a little quicker because she would be very embarrassed about that. She was apologizing as they were pulling her out. But let me just tell you something, how God works. <clears throat> well, that's happened several times, and so that's why I'm not as upset as I would be if that were the first time. Um, and she's awake and alert, of course. Today, I was going to be, we're in Colossians, and I, I know what you're thinking. Hot dog, I'm going to get out of church, church early. But anyway, I'm going to preach this sermon. I'll try to do it in a hurry, but uh, in Colossians 3, 12 through 17 is our text. But I, let me tell you, the title was Perfection. Last week, it was Satisfaction. Remember, we were talking about being satisfied with the Lord. Today, we're going to talk about perfection. My intent was to talk about the perfect church. Now, not, I'm not trying to, I don't want to get the idea started that this is the perfect church. However, I couldn't have put together a better skit to, to illustrate what I'm getting ready to be talking about than what we've just seen, which is somebody in our midst that we love and care for in need, and everybody not thinking about themselves, but doing exactly what they need to do to care for that person. You can't get a better example of than that. And so as I was praying and the Lord just began to say, I, I, this is the perfect moment to talk about what, see, God has put us together here for a purpose, not just for that. But there's um, Jonathan and others that are, Jonathan Green, and others that are trained who know exactly what to do in a situation like that, who don't lose their heads and know what to do. And there's um, Danny's here and some other, some men who are willing to come in and help. And so that's a, a great um, visual as we think about what God's church, God's people are supposed to look like in this world. We've been in Colossians now for some time. And so uh, we're going to be today in Colossians 12 through 17 in chapter 3. And so I'd like to ask you if you would, it's on the screen and would, You'd stand with me as I read that passage in Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, therefore, as always means, because of what I've just said, because of who you are and because of what's happened here, therefore, as the elect of God, the chosen, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, Humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ Dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray together. Father God, I'm so thankful to be able to be here this morning. Lord, not like I thought it was going to be. Often it's not, Lord. But Father, you are teaching us a great lesson today and every day, and that is to trust you. Lord, I love Sarah, and I would give my life for her. You know that. And Jonathan would, sure, for sure. But, Lord, there's not anything much we can do in times like this. But, Father, we can trust you, continue to love you. We know that you love her more than we ever could, even if we can't understand that. And so, Lord, for some reason, you've prepared us today, and you've given us this opportunity today, and, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to take it, help us to see it, as you would have us to see it. And Lord, I pray that you give me power and passion to deliver your message to your people. And Lord, I pray that you would be exalted in everything that's said and done in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And you can be seated. So man, there's been some great lessons in Colossians. Uh, and the most important one, of course, is the very first one, which is Jesus is first. Jesus is first in every situation. Jesus is first when your loved one 
is going to the hospital. Jesus is first when you don't really know what to do. He's first all the time, anytime, all the time. Remember, Paul didn't know these people. Yet, when, I, when asked to write or prompted by the Holy Spirit to write a letter, the first thing he says is to them is, uh, hey, my name's Paul. Jesus needs to be number one in your life. If you're called, if you're elected, if you are the one, if you're saved, sanctified, if you will, filled with the Holy Spirit, however you want to say it, if you're one of his, then he's got to be first in every situation. And so that's who we look to. That's who we listen to. That's who we trust. And then last week we finished the, the third of three roadblocks. The next thing that Paul did was to say now that you're, uh, you've got the foundation laid of Jesus Christ in your life. Now that that's taken care of, now look out for these things. Watch out for a lot of philosophy. You know, the, the thirst for knowledge. Nothing wrong with getting knowledge, but you don't want to replace that with a relationship with Christ. And then legalism. Don't live by a list. There's five things I've got to do to be justified, and I've got to come to church, and I've got to tithe, and I've got to do these other things. I've got to be good. I've got to listen to Christian music, whatever it is. That's legalism. That doesn't get you justified. And then last week, carnality, which is just our old sin nature. And I, we'd, we'd love to put that to death. We talked about uh, how he said, by the way, kill it, remember? Put it to death. I would love to. I can't quite seem to squeeze the life out of my sin nature like I would like to. But to, and, and then being satisfied with the Lord was that whole uh, sermon last week. And now today, I want us to talk about what, it's gonna, what that looks like. I believe that's what the therefore is there for. Because we've got Jesus as our foundation, and because we are avoiding these other roadblocks, philosophy, legalism, carnality, and they're all in the world today, by the way. This is not just in the first century. This is now. Because we're doing those things, this is what you're going to look like as a body. This is what you look like as an individual. So that's why I said perfection would be the title today. We're going to see what a, the, the church would look like. So if I was to say to you, what would the perfect church look like, I want to ask you some questions about it. Would it be Baptist or not? W would it matter? Would it be King James only? Or will we uh, use some new King James, the NIV once in a while, would we read the ESV? How would we do that? Would we be involved in, in missions if we were the perfect church? How about debt? Would we, would we be all right with borrowing money because we want to build a new building or do something? Would we have a dynamic children's program? I mean, is that a must? Is that a deal breaker? What about the student ministry? I mean, is that important? I mean, they're just students, right? They're the children. Eh. Or, or is that on the top of the list? Oh, what about music? Uh-oh. Now we're getting ready to mess up. Well, what kind of music would it be? Would it be hymns or contemporary? Would it go all one way where we try to do blended? What would we do? Would we have blue carpet? Would it matter? <laughs> would we have a good-looking pastor? <laughs> or would it matter? No. Would I wear a tie and a coat? Or would it matter? See, the text today is about the characteristics of the new life that you and I live, that we live in Christ, together and individually. See, if Jesus is first, then there are things that we have. There are things that, that we've been given. And they're so evident to the world that we can't hide them. The lost world can see a difference. Jennifer, we're here, and we're to, she's shared this with many of you. If she were to talk to you about how I was prior to us getting married and that kind of thing, when I was still out in the world, I had been saved at a young age, but I was choosing the world for a time, she would say to you that, that there was always something different about me. See, I don't see it. I don't believe so. I was just out there in the world, just like people that you know. But you see, when we get filled with the Holy Spirit, we can't hide that. And if you can hide it, then you need to go back and talk to them about why you can hide it. You see, those things are so evident. They come out. We can't help but see them. We cannot help, and the world cannot help, but be touched by Jesus and changed then themselves. Not because necessarily of the words you speak, even though they are very important. Do you ever hear me say, or don't you ever think that I'm asking you to live right, but don't tell anybody about Jesus? No. I'm talking about words, but actions too. We've got to look like and sound like Jesus and, and the people that he's called. So 
if the church is filled with changed people, then can the community help but be changed? I don't think so. Uh, you know, the, the world around us, we talk about changing the world. Sunday night, Wednesday night, we talked about our topic was how did the disciples turn the world upside down? I started off by saying I believe they righted it and didn't turn it upside down, but that's just semantics. Did they change the world? Yes. How? Because they sounded different and they looked different. What did they have? They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they had the power and they were willing to go all the way to death. Don't you imagine that there was a little bit of their carnal nature that thought, man, I would really rather not be crucified. But I love Jesus too much. He's done too much. I used to be, but I'm not anymore. And man, I want this world to see him more than anything else. And that's exactly how we are to look and live and sound. You see, the first century Christians did exactly that. They lived in community in such a way as to affect the world around them. And, you know, I have been over the last two or three years, maybe longer than that, concerned about us, this looking like and being a New Testament church as much as is possible uh, and looking like the New Testament church. And I realize we're not all going to, you know, eat lunch together every day and quit our jobs and just be here together uh, and, you know, that kind of thing, moving from house to house maybe exactly like the Scripture says. However, that's not exactly what, I'm talking about. I think I, I think we're to live in community like they did, sharing and having things in common, loving one another, putting ourselves out for one another, because that's what God has called us to do. And, and we already I already mentioned the therefore in verse twelve, but the tense and voice in in Greek, the terms, the words have a tense and a voice, and it determines what the word means or how you know we understand them. And the therefore and the word put on is an imperative, which means it's a command. That doesn't mean that he just says, well, what I'd really like for y'all to do is look a little different than the world and maybe, you know, love one another once in a while. That's not what he says. By using these words, these specific words, he says, you now that your mind live like this. Do it this way because I said do it that way because I love you and because your life's not the same anymore and because I'm, I've, I'm using you to affect the rest of the world. We're commanded to live this way again it's not a suggestion and if we live that way then the church the body of Christ would look like Jesus and we would sound like Jesus last three weeks we talked about the three things that we put off or guard against and we guard against those things uh, you know even today the same things and so one when we guard against those when we remove something from our lives something's got to replace it and this is what replaces it the, today, we're talking about what replaces or fills that hole when we dig it all out and get, out, get rid of all that other philosophy and legalism, carnality, all that stuff that looks like, sounds like the world. We fill it then with Jesus. We fill it with the, then with this community. And so the first thing I want us to see today here is that we join hands. If we're the perfect church, we join hands, which means that we work together. We work together. As the elect, as those chosen, called out by God, saved, changed, headed to heaven, eternity in the bag, as those people, we are one body working together. And Paul lists these attributes that we have here. We put on tender mercies. We have compassion for one another. We love one another. A couple of you brothers, y'all didn't know it, because they, and they didn't intend you to hear it, but they leaned over to me as we were just praying and said, we love y'all. And thank y'all for so much for that. I do know that. But man, it doesn't hurt to be told. Everybody loves to hear that. And not only speaking it, but I could sit there and watch those men look after Sarah. And they do it because they love her. Not because of me, not because she's the pastor's daughter, not because she sang a solo, because they love her. Because God has given them that love, and he's done the same thing to all of us for one another. We put on these tender mercies, this compassion. And by the way, it's not just for us. That compassion translates. As a matter of fact, the world needs to see it. You know as well as I do that the world needs some love today. They need some compassion. They need somebody to back off and not try to get in front of the other car when they're merging. Just go ahead. I'll pull right behind you. The world needs to see us loving them 
and putting ourselves out in this sometimes. Kindness. Tender mercies and then kindness. Man, that goes a long way towards making a world a better place. Think about what kindness, real, genuine kindness. And then how about some humility? Anybody got any humility? Anybody got any extra? Sometimes I need something. It's not me first. We don't live like the world and look like the world. And then meekness. All these, I'm just hitting them kind of quick, but meekness. Nobody really wants to be called meek. We have the idea, we always have, of that being weakness, but that's not true. The Greek word is, the, the word picture there is of a horse with a bit in its mouth. All that power under control. God's the one holding the rein. We are powerful in the name of Christ. And he directs where we use, spend that power and use that power. It's power under control. That's what we're supposed to look like. And then long-suffering. Man, this is another one. Hmm. Think about what some patience. Nobody wants to say that. By the way, don't pray for patience. You'll get some twins like I did. I quit. I stopped doing that, but it was too late. The twins were already on the way. Anyway, we got some long-suffering. Bearing with one another. Some forgiveness. All these things, by the way, are just a practical thing. Man, you look around at the world today, there's not a whole lot of that around, it doesn't seem like. It's not just enough, by the way, not to retaliate. That's a good start. But that's not where we're headed. We need to genuinely love one another. You know, I've found out, Jennifer smiles all the time. And it, it changes the per, uh, complexion of everything around her, it seems. And yeah, some of you all are the same way. You walk into a situation with a smile on your face and everybody's instantly disarmed. Nobody's mad with you when you walk in smiling. It's hard to do that. We affect the situation just like that. You see, we genuinely love. We bring that genuine love. Some of the biggest, I think, enemies we face today in the church, in the body of Christ, are inside. They're not, we, we have the world certainly wants to destroy, Satan wants to destroy this. But man, we got to be careful. We need to start on the inside. Our words and our attitudes, how we love, how we serve. You see, we don't need wounds from friendly fire. The world is after us hard enough. And so then Paul goes on to say, if you have all these things, if you have Christ, then you have all these things. Then he lists the actions that go along with it. These are the attitudes that you have, and then you, your actions. You love because of all those other things. We show it, and we are at peace. I don't understand it except to say that the Holy Spirit has given me peace about all that's going on this morning. You see, we're not called to be peacekeepers. We're peacemakers. We bring peace into the situation. We, we change the, where we are by the fact that when we walk in, the Holy Spirit's there. He may, he's already there probably, but I know he walked in with me because I'm filled with him, and you are too, because you're his. And then we have, I got a, a picture here this morning uh, that's a, 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 a well-looked-after picture. A lot of you probably already seen that. This picture, a lot of people have talked about it. Billy Graham even wrote uh, about it in one of his books, but Alex Haley is who I want to talk about. Alex Haley is the author of Roots. Some of y'all are too young to remember that. But some of us are old enough to remember watching that when they showed it on TV so many years ago, probably in the late 70s maybe. I, I don't remember. I loved it. I remember watching it. It was a, uh, a saga about his family and about how they had been brought over to this country and enslaved and all that took place over all those years. Well, he's a pretty famous author, of course, very well thought of. And he's got that picture on his wall. And when he was asked about it, he was being interviewed. And when he was asked about it, he said to the interviewer, he said, well, he said, I write stuff, you know, roots and the other things I write, and people just tell me how good it is and just fall all over me and tell me it's perfect and it's great. And if I'm not careful, I start to believe that. But then I glance at that picture, and I realize when I look at that, one thing I think about is that that turtle could not get on that post by himself. Somebody had to help him get up there. And so somebody had to help me get where I am, and somebody's got to help you, somebody's got to help us, and that's how we work, you see. I can't be successful here by myself, and you can't either, but man together, we can love the Lord, we can submit to Him, and we can do His will all over this place. 
We can do it in our homes. We can do it in this building. We can do it in this community and everywhere we go if we will join hands, if we will work together like he says we're to work together. Man, the world needs you, and the world needs me, and boy, it needs us. So the perfect church, that's what we, we would join hands and work together. Now, secondly, we would raise our hands. Man, we would work together, yes, but woo, we'd worship together. I tell you, there's nothing like coming in worshiping together. Man, I love to worship with you all. I love to hear you sing. I love to sing with you. I love to talk to you about the things that God has shown us in the Word. But man, worship is not just what we do right now. It's not just on Sunday morning. And if it is for you just on Sunday morning, then I can't wait for you to find what God is wanting to show you this morning. It's not just an attitude that we have here on Sunday morning. We don't come to worship at church alone. We come to corporately worship here. But this is an attitude that we take with us everywhere we go. Monday through Saturday we worship individually with our families, but together we get to get on Sunday morning. But we don't listen. Listen, don't limit worship to where you are. Because if worship takes place for you in this place, then you've got to come here to worship. Well, what do you do the rest of the week? Do you not talk to the Lord? Do you not hear from Him? Do you not feel the Holy Spirit welling up inside you and you want to just shout, Hallelujah, thank you, Lord, for whatever it may be? Are you never reminded during the week that you're saved then too? That God has put together His Word and given it to you? Man, we don't limit worship. It's got nothing to do with where we are. We worship, you know, in the yard a while during COVID. And that was awesome. Matter of fact, I wouldn't mind doing that again. We talked about doing that once a year just to remind ourselves that we can worship outside. We can go somewhere else. We go once a year to the fairgrounds. And I don't know, maybe y'all don't call that worship because we're not in here. I do. We can worship because of our attitude. It's because of who we love. It's because of who we're assigning worth to. See, if our worship is attached just to this place, when we leave this place, it'll just be a memory. By the way, the, my definition, or a good definition, if you will, of worship is letting God's word invade our hearts and transform us so that we can walk a Christ-like life. You see, we listen to his word, we read it back to him, we sing it back to him, we ask him to speak into us. The word dwells in us abundantly. It teaches us. It admonishes us. It corrects us and convicts us. The scripture tells us that it's living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Worship does sometimes involve songs. Nothing wrong with that. And it involves music. But not in order that we debate the style, but to declare to God that we are here today to worship you. Not about me. It's not about us. It's about you, Lord. That's what we get together for. Worship is obeying the word. Live in the Word, praising the risen Lord Jesus because of who He is and what He's done. A celebration of Christ. That's what we're here for. It's not about celebrating me. I would like to celebrate me. I like to celebrate me. Don't you? Sure you do. I know y'all. But we think about here, and when we're worshiping Him, wherever we are, in the car, wherever it is, outside, at home, we, what God has done. So then we work together, we join hands, and then we raise our hands as we worship together, and then, number three, we offer our hands. We witness together. We are not here to <clears throat> just get together on Sunday morning. By the way, we get together on Sunday night too, 6 o'clock, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We're going to eat before we get together this week. Just what I thought I'd throw that in a little commercial. Y'all want to come. But we're here to, we're called, listen, it's not about us getting together. We're called to impact the world. That's why we're here. That's what this is all about. You know, I, I read this this week, I thought about it. If you paid to go to a football game, and you watching them, and the teams come out, and the team that gets the ball, the offense, they run up and get in the huddle, and they stand in that huddle. Now, when they do that, you know what they're doing in there, right? They're calling the play. But if they just stood there the whole game and talked to one another in that little group, you'd feel like you wasted your money, wouldn't you? You know, I like the huddle. You know what I like the 
You know, when I was in high school, you're not going to believe this, but I wouldn't lie to you from the pulpit. I was the center on the the football team. I didn't start, but I was the center on the football team a long time ago. And I was even smaller then, believe it or not. Maybe not tall, uh, maybe not shorter, but anyway, I didn't weigh near as much. But I was the one that started the huddle. You'd run back 10 yards or so, and I'd just stop. And when I stopped, that's, everybody formed around me and got in a group. Back then, we did it in two lines. We leaned over like this so the people in the back could hear it. And the blocking back, we'd run a single wing. The blocking back would come up, and he'd call the play, 32, which means the, the, the fullback gets the ball and runs up the two-hole right straight up the middle. Anyway, it don't matter. You don't care where he's running, but we call the play. And then you know what we do? Break. And then we run up there. We all take our place. He calls. He says, hut. I snapped the ball, and everybody blocks, and we run the play. That's what everybody came to see, right? But if we stand in that huddle all the time and never run a play, nothing ever takes place. Our challenge is not what we do in the huddle. It's how we run the play. Did you know, y'all didn't know, anybody that played football, did you know that every play is designed to end in a touchdown? Did you know that? Every play. They don't always. Every play, though, is designed. You know why? Because on a piece of paper, I would make the block I was supposed to make. I wouldn't miss it. I wouldn't dive on the ground and miss the guy that weighs three times what I weigh. If I did what I was called to do, and I did it perfectly, and everybody else did too, the man with the ball ends up in the end zone every time. If the snap's perfect, if the count's right, if the blocks are right, if the route is right, the path is on time and in place, everything works for a touchdown. Let me tell you something. All this is designed to put the ball in the end zone, to get people to know who Jesus Christ is and to come to know him as Savior and Lord. Every play is designed for that. We're not designed to huddle. Nothing wrong with huddling. We need to get together and talk about what the play is going to be. The play this week is to get out of here. Somebody that doesn't know Jesus and tell them about him. Tell them that you were lost, but now you're saved. Tell them that no matter what happens to me, no matter what happens to my family, my feelings may be hurt, my concern may be there, but man, I love Jesus because he loved me first. That's the play. And that play is designed to work every time. Now, you're not perfect, and I'm not, and this won't be perfect because we all have still still got our sin natures. But our desire is to run that play and get the end zone. By the way, listen, when I was in high school, Coach Brooks called 32, that play I mentioned. First play, every game he ever coached, that was the play. He'd say, we're going to run it down there, cotton-picking folks. And he meant that. they do it every time. It didn't work most of the time. But every now and then, every now and then, what he'd block that hole open up, and he'd run 100 yards and score a touchdown. That's the way it's designed. That's the way this is designed to work. Again, our challenge is not what we do in the huddle. We need to be sure it's right, and this is the huddle, of course, but it's what happens when we break, when we leave here, when we get out of this. You see, we've all got an assignment. We've all got a block to make. And just like that football player, your block's right. Man, the goal's achieved. We live like believers We look like believers. We sound like believers. I don't say, I do say, I probably shouldn't say to people that I'm a Baptist pastor. What I ought to say, though, is that I'm a believer. That's what I am. I'm a believer because of who he is, because of what he's done, not because of me. I believe because of who I have met, because my life has been changed, and the world will be changed if you and I will believe like that. Don't you want to be part of that body? Everybody wants to be on the winning team. You know, when I was in high school, I played in 1980, 80, 80, 81, 81, 82 when I was in a junior in high school. And I've still got my Princeton jacket. I can't get it on. I put one arm, and then I'll take that out and put that on, but I can't wear it anymore. But you know what I've got on there? I've got a great big old patch. You see, we won the regional championship and went to the state championship in 1979 I won't own the team but they when I got that jacket they had put that on there 
And boy, I like that. Everybody, I, I, I should have had taken it off, to be honest. But I like being a part of the winning team. I played the band on the winning team. We didn't win the region when I was in playing. But everybody wants to be part of a winning team. You want me to tell you how to be part of the champion? Sign on this morning if you're not already on the list. Sign on. Let me tell you what the signing bonus is. Salvation. Ha! Eternity is your signing bonus. Man, we get it all. We know who Jesus is. We live like we know him. Like we know him personally. Like we talk to him. Like he talks to us. The perfect church will never be on this side of heaven. But that doesn't mean we still don't run the play. Every play on the football field doesn't result in a touchdown, but we still run it. We still run it. We huddle up again, we break, and we run another play. That's what we do here. Will you do that? Man, don't you want it? What it it's just described as something so awesome. Don't you want to be a part of this body that Paul describes here? Loving one another, serving with one another, being loved and looked after. Boy, when somebody comes up to you and whispers in your ear, we love you and your family. Nothing like that. <laughs> because we love one another. We worship together. We work together. We witness together. And then we watch what God does in our own lives and in the lives of the people that he brings us to. That's what all this is about. We will achieve perfection one day when we step into glory. Until then, it's our job to strive for it here. And that means that we're loving him, worshiping him everywhere we go, believing him, trusting him, and sharing him. Do you know him like that? If you don't know Christ as your Savior right now is the time, we're going to open the altar. I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. Thank you. And I'm going to, we're going to love on you. If you need, if you got some questions about whether you're right with, with him or not, you need to come up here and lay that sin down. If you know of something in your life that's impeding your walk with Christ, you need to come up here right now and take care of that. And you know how you do that? You admit it. You tell the Lord, I'm sorry. I messed up, and I don't want to do that anymore. Would you help me? Would you forgive me? That's how you do that. I don't know where you are on that one. I don't know where you know. I hope you know Christ. I hope you're sharing him with everything you've got. Most of us are somewhere on that journey. Right now is the time to respond. Right now is when the Holy Spirit's at work speaking to you, letting you know where you are, and letting you know also of his desire to draw you closer. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for what we've seen here today for the love that we've seen, for the care that we've seen. And Lord, I pray, I do pray for Sarah, Father. I think she's doing much better. And Lord, I pray that your will would be done in this place with these people. Lord, if there's somebody in here that doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, I pray that right now that they would feel your Holy Spirit drawing them. If there's somebody who made a profession of faith some time ago, but they're not living the life because of sin and the cares of the world, Father, I pray that you would not let them leave here, that you would prick their heart and lead them to repentance. So if there's somebody, Lord, that needs to join this fellowship, Father, I pray that you just move us to do what you've called us to do so that when we leave here, Father, we will be effective in your power and in your strength. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And we ask, Father, you to do what only you can do here in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us? Sing this hymn and respond to the Holy Spirit as he speaks to you.
Let's pray. Dear Lord, we ask you, uh, be with Jonathan and Sarah, Lord, as they're going through uh, what, they're, <clears throat> what they're dealing with this morning, Lord, and we ask you to be with the youth and safe return travels for them, Lord, from their trip, Lord, and we know that uh, you've touched their hearts through songs this weekend, Lord, and we thank you for that, and um, we appreciate every opportunity to have, Lord, that we've been, the play's been called this morning, we pray that each person that's in this huddle this morning goes out and try to execute the play, Lord, that we draw others to you and that they may see you in each and every one of us. So, Lord, be with us as we go out through these doors. You have equipped us now. Help us to be obedient and go and do your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.